then is Annalise and Anna have two Ukrainian teens at one of the Nazis with Susan Cohen and Greg Dawson. Um, we also hope that you'll explore 32 events that are happening throughout the museum today, meet some of our 85 speakers, and get both signed at one of the 72 offer signings on our main lobby and our events hall on the second floor. While you're here, we also encourage you to take the time to visit our exhibition, The Holocaust, What He Can Do, on our main level, and Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Scholler on the third floor. Andy Goldsworth, Garden of Stones, is on our second floor, just outside of our Lux Cafe, which is also open today. Um, and then in the fall, we'll be opening a children's and family exhibit called The Danish Rescue, so stay tuned for information about that. And then you can also pick up gifts and books at the Pikmin Museum shop um, and visitor services on the main level. We are encouraging people to wear masks in the museum today, and we hope you'll share feedback with us in our post-festival survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. Um, this program has been made possible in part from support for the, by the Battery Park City Authority and your donations, so thank you very much. And now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Susan Hood is the award-winning author of many books for young readers, including Life Boat 12, Ava's Violin, Shaking Things Up, The Last Draw, Kids in Plastics, and Titan in the Wild Boars, The True Cave Rescue of the Thai Soccer Team. She is a recipient of an E.B. White Honor Award, the Christopher Award, the Americas Award, the SCBWI Golden Kite Award, and the Bay Street Flora Steglitz Strauss Award. And Greg Dawson has been a journalist for over 50 years, winning awards for his work as a TV critic, columnist, and feature writer at, museum, at magazines and newspapers, including the Boston Herald, Indianapolis Star, and Orlando Sentinel. Sentinel sorry. He is the author of two books on the Holocaust, Hiding in the Spotlight and Judgment Before Nuremberg and Busted in Bloomington, a collected memoir of the 60s written by his wife, Candy Dawson. Um, and both books will be available in the Pippin store after the conclusion of the talk, and then the authors will be signing on the second floor. So without further ado, please welcome our speakers. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Greg and I co-authored this book. Uh, but first, we're going to sort of tell you about how that all came to be. Um, this is a non-fiction biography in verse, um, and it's about Jana Arshlinskaya, who is Greg's mom. And uh, often, if anybody else here is a writer, you know that when you're researching one book, you may find your next book. So that's what happened to me. I was working on my book, Life Boat 12, uh, which is a World War II middle grade book, also in verse. And so I read a whole bunch of um, other World War II books, and I happened to read this book, Hiding in the Spotlight, which is Greg's adult book about his mom and his aunt. And so I was quite impressed with the book, and it was about these two young girls. And I am the mother of two young girls, one of whom is here. Um, and then the grandmother of two tiny little girls. So stories about brave girls really resonate with me and stay with me, as this one did. So I went about my business, I finished Life Book 12, but I could not stop thinking about these two girls. So there's Freena, age 12, on the left, and Jana, age 14, on the right. Um, they were both Jewish um, piano prodigies super, super talented from a very young age. Um, I think Jana was on the radio at what, age six, six. or something? Yeah. Um, they are also both among the only known survivors of Dravitsky Yar. Um, do all of you know what Dravitsky Yar is? Because I find when I talk to school visits, many people do not know. Um, so Dravitsky Yar is lost history. It's a crime that happened at the dawn of the Holocaust. Um, most middle school kids start studying the Holocaust, and we learn about you know, the Netherlands and France and Poland. But Ukraine and Lithuania and those countries where really the Holocaust started is either very underreported or not reported at all. Um, so this is where the Nazis were rounding up Jewish people, um, marching them off to a ravine, and shooting them. So it's called the uh, Holocaust of Bullets. The other thing I loved about this story was the connection to music and the life-saving power of the arts. Um, and then the fourth thing I loved was this story finally came out after being buried for, what, 15 years? <laughs> Thanks to a 13-year-old who had a homework assignment 
to go home and interview a relative. So, Greg will yes. tell us where about that. Yes. And uh, thanks, Susan. Yes, um, I grew up uh, in Southern Indiana um, uh, in a secular home, and um, uh, I knew my mother. Uh, I knew my mother had come to this country uh, after the war, and not much else. I knew she came from Russia. She spoke Russian to me when I was a child. But uh, there was never any mention, uh, she never talked about her story, this story uh, that we tell, we tell in the book, um, or that uh, I didn't even actually grow up knowing uh, I was Jewish. And, uh, and so, yes, all of this was really unknown to me until about age 30. And, um, and then uh, I found out about it uh, uh, through, a, my mother told me about it very, very briefly in broad, uh, broad outlines, which I did for a short story in the newspaper I was working for then. But, uh, but then nothing more was said about it until our daughter Amy, who was seen here, uh, how old would she have been there, Candy, about? She was about eight. About eight years old. When our daughter Amy was in middle school in, uh, in Winter Park, Florida, which is near Orlando, uh, they had uh, an assignment from their social studies teacher to interview uh, a grandparent about what that grandparent's life was like at the same age that these kids were. Yeah. And so uh, Amy actually only had one grandparent to choose from. At that point, it was my mother. And so she said she was going to write to her and ask her that question. And Candy and I both thought uh, we, we knew my mother's reluctance to talk about it, uh, except for that one time when I was younger. And so we thought uh, privately, well, good luck with that, because uh, we didn't expect that she would really be willing to talk to Amy. But uh, grandchildren uh, and grandparents' uh, relationships being fundamentally different, as we're learning now, delightfully, through our first grandchild, uh, are completely different. And, and my mother decided, uh, in response, to send, uh, send uh, Amy a, a four-page handwritten letter, uh, really uh, divulging her, you know, this telling her about the story in much more personal, uh, much more personal, emotional terms, detailed terms than she had ever told me. And um, it's because Amy asked, and her grandchild asked. And from that point on, this is 1994, from that point on, my mother became much more willing, in fact, eager to talk about her experience. And she kind of understood the importance of Amy knowing, but not just Amy, but her friends and her generation and future generations. And so she became very, very eager to talk about it, became kind of evangelical about it, to use an awkward word. But, uh, but that, uh, at that point, she agreed that the story should be told in a book. And so she and I went about it. it took about eight years or so to get it done, uh, more than that. And that produced Hiding in the Spotlight. But um, so uh, that, that was the genesis of, of Hiding. Um, so. And then um, when you were researching, he actually went, he and um, he and his wife went to Ukraine and actually met, saw all the places and met some of the people. So Candy Dawson did this incredible movie that we're going to show you. It's about five minutes long. Um, now let's see. Come back here. Um, yeah. <laughs> While they're solving that, I should say, this is like a five minutes of a 17-minute film. This is an excerpt, a, a good five-minute excerpt from the, from the film. to Ukraine, we, you will see the home of the Bogancha family that sheltered Greg's mother and her sister. And this is Mariana, who is the granddaughter of that family from Kharkov, Ukraine. And she just happened to be in New York this weekend. So here's Mariana. <laughs> We're opening the doors to a story hidden for 60 years. This little Jewish girl, Jana Arshatskaya, has finally told her story. 
She was born in Ukraine on the Sea of Azov in the little fishing village of Berjansk. Her son Greg went back to walk in her footsteps. Greg found the conservatory in the city of Haikov where his mother and her younger sister Frina had studied. Then he found their home, 48 Kitsartsky Street. It was behind these doors that his mother and her family had lived, a family that Greg would never know. When the Nazis came calling, only Jana and Frena escaped. Greg found the memorial outside the city to the 16,000 Jews of Haikov who were told they were going to a labor camp. It was bitterly cold. Dmitry Arshansky had a plan. He turned to a Ukrainian collaborator on the march and said, look at me, I'm not a Jew. Turn your head, let my daughter go. I have something in my pocket to give you. Here, just take it and turn your head. Jana jumped out of line and the rest of the family marched on to Dobritsky Yard. When Greg found the site of the ravine itself, he placed flowers in honor of his family who died and all the 16,000 who perished. He knew what happened there. throughout the war. Jana told the truth that she was a Jew just like the others in the camps to Larry Dawson. He helped her and Frina get on the first ship to the United States and Jana and Frina got scholarships to the Juilliard but there was one more lie that she was hiding the false birthday from all those years ago. Uh, but this is the first time ever since the war started I could say that my birthday is on April 1st instead of the 25th of December, mm -hmm. and I was 80 years old then. And this is the first time we've ever celebrated her real birthday. April April. Well, this is a, a new birthday celebration, but you're going to have to choose between April 1st and, 20, and, and December 25th. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get double birthdays. Mm -hmm. Are you sure that you're I can swing it? <laughs> sure. uh, maybe for one year. You get one year of double birthdays and then the next year you have to choose. Maybe I'll become a swindler. <laughs> <laughs> this year you can get double. Next year it's one or the other. There'll be a long
So then a lot of people would say to me, okay, that's an amazing story, but why tell that story to kids? And to me, because these girls were 12 and 14, they were middle schoolers, you know, and that's when you start studying, the, that's when you start studying the Holocaust is in eighth grade. And to me, it was kind of a no-brainer. Um, and it's all so painfully relevant these days. Um, you know, as this museum is a testament to, the survivors are starting to die out. And there are so many Holocaust deniers and misinformation out there. This was a survey that was done in 2020 across the 50 states of millennials and Gen Z people. Um, and they found that the shocking facts, they thought 10% of them believe that Jews started the Holocaust. 58% um, said they believe the Holocaust could happen again. So I think it's more important than ever to get these stories out there. Um, the, the other question people ask is why tell this story in free verse? And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, I really wanted to reflect the music of the story, and so using wordplay and internal rhyme and things like that seemed to fit really well. And also, all the white space around the poems gives kids a little breathing room and a little insulation from these really scary things. So that seemed to work really well, too. Um, there was also a tradition of poetry behind Drabitsky Yar and Baba Yar. Um, Hitler covered this up for decades, and then after him, Stalin covered it up. And so the truth really didn't come out until the Soviet Union dissolved. You know, they finally admitted that peaceful Soviet citizens were killed, but they never said Jews. They were all Jews. Mm -hmm. um, and this poet, um, Yevtushenko, wrote a poem about Bobby Yar, and also a poem called The Apple Trees of Dravitsky Yar. Um, and so that's the power of the arts. The, you know, the arts get the truth out there. And then Shostakovich took his poem and set it to music. Mm -hmm. So all that came out before it was you know, in the news. Um, and then the memorial to Dravitsky Yar was only finished in 2002. So it's all sort of fairly new. However, here we go again. History repeats itself. Um, there's Dravitsky Yar that has been bombed by Putin. Um, and then you want to talk about the good news at the end of this presentation? Uh, yes, by the way, I wish you'd been around writing books when I was in school. I would have oh. done a lot better. <laughs> all that blank space. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say briefly about yeah. why to do this book the way you did it. Um, um, you know, the thing that, the remarkable thing about this book when I, when I read it, and she, you know, Susan sent me the manuscript, is that, is that, you know, hiding the spotlight, I did the best I could as, uh, to, to tell the story uh, uh, as factually as I could. And, um, and finally, I managed to do that. I had never written a book before. I was a, did not see myself as a book writer, a newspaper reporter, and columnist. So, um, so I finally got it done, and I think that, I think that it, it told the story well. But what struck me about Susan's uh, iteration of this and why it's so important to do this particular book is that she put on the page the inherent kind of musicality and, and poetry of this whole story in a way that, that I think that appeals, to kid, appeals to kids' imaginations in a way that pure fact does. Mine is sort of repertorial and nothing wrong with that, but kids especially, I think, uh, uh, react to they hear the music and they sense the poetry and things, and I think that that's what you put on the page that I couldn't put on the page with my with my prose. Big difference, Pro, prose and poetry. So, yeah. uh, what well, was the question? Oh yes, about the Vigancha family. Uh, well, you saw a little bit about, um, of course, you know, Mariana is here, and uh, this is uh, it's amazing that she can be here today. But uh, but the thing is the um, to leap to the end to the to the key point here about is that. Um, in January, this young man getting off an airplane in Los Angeles, his name is Alex Boganja. He is the great-grandson, am I getting this right? Great-grandson of the same Boganja family that sheltered my mother and Frina. Mm -hmm. Candy and I have had, and there he is, Candy and I uh, uh, became involved uh, about a year ago with an organization in California called uh, um, Ukrainian Mothers and Children Transport 
who's, which is providing free legal care, um, free legal advice to uh, Ukrainians who fled the war and wanted to come to this country. So we became involved with that organization. And then uh, a person came along, this Ukrainian named Alex, who wanted to, become, to get here, and they helped him. It turned out that he, as I said, was a great grandson. So this story has a remarkable, it comes full circle in may, ways that we never could have imagined that our family is able to help him the way their family was able mm. to help my mother wow. oh, and 80 years later. So that doesn't happen all the time. Mm. And so that's the that's a remarkable part of that story, of the whole gotcha story. And his whole family is coming, right? They hope to. Yeah, uh, just Alex is coming. And he he's uh, already, they've arranged for a, uh, he's enrolled at Santa Monica College with a scholarship. And he will get off the plane in January and we'll go to school in February and hopefully the, the family will come. Uh, they hope to come sometime. That's, they're still working on that part yeah, of it. So. Okay, so that's basically all we want to say so we can open it up to any questions you guys might have. Yeah? Um, hi, uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm actually first generation Ukrainian American. My family is from Kiev, Ukraine. So. Mm -hmm. um, it's been weird, so to speak, yeah. um, watching the news and just like um, watching a country you never visited, but it's mm -hmm. technically your roots. Mm -hmm. And just like, how do you, like, how do, I'm a writer, so I'm just like, I'm constantly trying to explore everything in my writing, but it just feels like, how do you like deal with the difficulty of that? Like between not just something that's like, are you entitled to trauma even if you're not directly involved to it? Or like, how do you deal with your family's trauma? Even just like sometimes asking about it, it feels like pulling out teeth on Novocaine because you feel guilty for tr triggering their pain. Well, I think you should never. I think you should never feel guilty for telling a story that needs to be told. I mean, on the simplest level, because it's not just your story, your family's story. It's a story of, of, of certainly many families like yours and beyond your family uh, to those in other, other, other countries, and other ethnicities and everything who have sort of the same kinds of stories. As far as trauma is concerned, it's interesting that there is a, a whole genre of literature in this country now of, uh, it was by third generation survivors, third generation. And so, and so uh, your first generation and your, your story so if they're still doing the third generation stories here as they are, and they should, and they're, they're many of them are they're wonderful, then it gives you a little perspective and you should not feel shy about, it, for any reason, telling your own story because it's, it's important to be told, so. Yeah, and I think it's important to get it down. Mm -hmm. And it might be painful, but it also might be cathartic to get it down. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm not related to this story and I'd be typing, I'd be crying my eyes out. And I just went to a school visit in Switzerland, and as I was telling kids about the story, I got really emotional, you know? And so it's, it's a really scary, horrible thing. But I don't think emotion is a bad thing. I mean, these kids were kind of surprised that I was getting emotional, but it made an impact. And it was an international school, so there were Ukrainian kids there and Russian kids there. So it was kind of a really amazing conversation. Any other questions? Well, let me say while well, there's a pause here while we're formulating questions. <laughs> the, 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 Susan mentioned that we went to Candy and I went to Ukraine uh, to do research for the book. That's only after I produced my first manuscript, which was uh, people read and they said, wow, this is really uh, an amazing story. Uh, and a good friend of mine at the newspaper whose judgment I really respected, she also said, wow, what an amazing story. And she, and she said, but I think what you've got here is, is an outline for a book. And that was like, ouch, I thought I was done. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and she said, and Candy also felt this way, and that, that the problem was that it was way too repertorial, and it lacked heart, basically. Mm. <laughs> it lacked heart, it lacked, lacked a, not that I wasn't sympathetic, but on the page it lacked it. And it lacked a sense of place and a sense of of what my mother's experience had been like on the ground, as I say. So the only way to fix that, and he said, you know, you need to go to, you need to, go to Ukraine. I thought, do I really have to go to Ukraine? <laughs> it's going to go a long way, it's going to be expensive and all that stuff. But she was right, and so we went. And that made all the difference, because I literally walked the same 
steps that my mother and my family did. And we went to the house, to the houses you saw there, and 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 that gave me the sense of place I needed to to um, to be able to uh, to to reach the kind of uh, emotions that to, to try to, to bring that to the to the page some that made it not just a report but it made a story a big difference and so um, so that that's important it's important to note because um, for when you're writing you show don't make the same mistake I did mm -hmm. and uh, yes uh, sorry what was that mistake, the mistake well like? to, to, well to basically to, to hold back in any way mm -hmm. um, it, you know what's the worst that could happen you know, write it down, and and if nobody, uh, you know, it's, you need to get it. As Susan was saying, get it down on paper, and that's going to be you have to be your truest self and, and putting it down there, and then you can go back and look at it and change it or delete it or whatever. But while you're feeling that way, is the time you you've got to do it so you don't lose that. Candy. Uh, yeah, I just I have to say that that. The heart of the book, you know, they're they're both wonderful in, 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 in different ways, but to me, the heart of the book was already there, and it's in both books in italics. It's Jana's yes, actual right. words, right. and it, these are words that are like not like most of us, where somebody gives you an interview and you formulate your your answer. These were recorded words just. To, from her heart and verbatim, and they're musical in, in the way that she is as well, and um, so that's that's really to me the the heart of the story are her words, and she um, had such a, a pristine memory of, of everything that she told us about, and um, anyway, Mariana, your father is in Harkov now, right? Yeah, he is, and. Uh, the same house where, which you saw where Greg was let into the, through the gate, because it was, it's like a, several houses and they're sharing the same garden. And uh, after the war, actually, there was only one Ukrainian family living of my grandparents and my mother, and the rest of the neighbors were Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was the neighborhood, you know, that after the, the war, it was very good that people came back to, to mm -hmm. not to their houses because of the tragedy of Drobetsky Yar, but so this house is still there, but because of the war now in early April, it, the missile uh, fall just across from the street. So this house was affected, uh, the, the windows were broken and uh, my grandmother, who is a widow of uh, Nikolai, uh, the classmate of Jana, she is now not there. She is uh, in Spain. So my father, who is her uh, son-in-law, he took her from Kharkiv to countryside place that we have by the Kharkiv. But it's relatively safe place because in the woods and there are a lot of things around happening, but not particularly there. And then uh, we managed to 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 transport them to Spain because my husband is Spanish and we decided it would be, you know, safer, easier. But my father, he came back to Kharkiv again. He brought my grandmother to Spain. My mom came to Spain because I reside in Abu Dhabi. I know it's complicated, but... <laughs> and my mom was there with me and my daughter and my husband when the war started. And, uh, and my father, he said, no, I cannot stay in Spain. I'm useless here. So he came back to Kharkiv. He is hosting people uh, in the countryside place, some, mm -hmm. some people who he know because they, they lived in uh, North Saltivka, which is under shilling for nine months. There is almost nothing left, uh, everything destroyed. So he's hosting now people there in this relatively safe space. As you may heard, now we have the power cuts all the time because of the shillings mm -hmm. and uh, there is no electricity, no water supply. So in the city it's uh, almost impossible to live right now. And uh, so at least there they have the fireplace, they have the wood, they have the gas, so even there is no electricity, at least they can sustain themselves right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so the history repeats itself in a way, but now Ukrainians 
other victims of this war because and I this there is a one name for this this is genocide because uh, it's not attacking the the military bases in Ukraine it's attacking the civil civil population infrastructure this is which is very important and it's cold in New York night right now but believe me in Ukraine it's even colder it's already snowing my father just sent me the picture with the forest full of snow and it complicates uh, things big time and there are a lot of people who who went to other countries and we are very grateful uh, really very grateful to us for all the support to people who are citizens of the united states we, we really feel this support not only from your government but we feel the support of people and what you are doing for for, for our people we are grateful to poland to polish people to estonians latvians lithuanians and the rest of europe because really they opened their borders to us as soon as the war started. And it's it really very, very important to us. But still, there are so many people who cannot live, elderly people, or they choose not to live because they have this sense of duty. Uh, even there, my father, he's 68. He, he is allowed to live, he is entitled to live, he is, you know, because un until you are 60, you are supposed as a man to stay in the country and serve the country. It's his, it's his choice. My friend, who actually hoped, uh, helped uh, Greg and Candy, Dasha, is my closest friend. She has one year old daughter. So her daughter turned one in June. So now most of her life she spent in war, in Kharkiv. And this is choice of Dasha, her mother, not to leave. Uh, again, she is also she is Jewish. Her husband is Jewish. They have the documents <coughs> in Israel, so they could have go there. You know, they could have lived in Israel already and flee the war. It's their choice not to leave and serve the country. To be there, he is serving uh, like in, in the. <coughs> <coughs> law enforcement. He's not in the army, but the law enforcement. And she she organized a charity for the women, the mothers to be, and uh, the, the the women who just gave birth to children. And because now the government doesn't have the opportunity to help children, you know, because before we had these baby boxes, material support. Now, unfortunately, with with the war and uh, the economy. Being on the bottom, there is no uh, no help from the government. So she organized for Kharkiv and the region. Now there are a lot of the occupied territories uh, around Ukraine. So she spread this uh, help to other territories. And this is her again. This is her personal choice to be there and to help. But uh, yeah, but the history again repeats itself <coughs> in all these different dimensions and areas. Um, our heart goes out to everybody, and, and uh, we've got cards uh, from the UMAC. And then, if you want to learn more about how they are helping, how you might help them, and, and that's you know, and we know people who are still in uh, Ukraine, and like like your dad have gotten to safer places. They don't want to leave, and we've said, you know, we've got this help. We can get you here, and they are the most courageous people we've ever known. Honestly, I know a few people too. <coughs> I was going to just ask about, um, did, after she did, I know you said she sort of became pathetic about her story after it was finally, she finally talked about it, I mean, but I'm curious more like about, did, did she, did her personality, did you feel like something changed about her more like intrinsically or emotionally as, as she did <coughs> her side, yeah. Not, not really. She didn't, um, she, it was just something that, that um, I mean, she, um, my earliest memories of her were, uh, aside from her being my mother, was that as a performer and, and her, and she and her playing. And, and, and in a lot of ways, that's the purest expression of who she was, in a lot of ways. And that didn't change. I mean, I think that, it, 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 I just think she was liberated by the, the whole experience of responding to Amy's uh, letter. Mm -hmm. And 
And of course, uh, Amy did the report, and then uh, that just led to a lot more exposure for it. And and she it just a light went off for her. And I, I think that it was something that, um, you know, you all probably know, if not personally, know lots of stories about Holocaust survivors who have not really been very open about their stories and been reluctant to talk about it. Also, just uh, uh, war veterans who are not Jewish have just been <coughs> the war being reluctant. And she was from that, basically, that generation that was a little bit uh, reluctant to talk about their personal experiences. But, but for her, no, once uh, she went through the experience with Amy, and it be was, became so apparent to her uh, how important it was for the story to get out there, I just think that it, it, she was liberated from that, from that, from whatever that reluctance was. Also, I don't know what part this played in it, but 1994, when uh, they had this exchange, was also the year that the, uh, DC, that the Holocaust Museum in D.C. opened, and also the year of Schindler's List. Now, I don't think my mother's ever seen Schindler's List. She, as a matter of fact, she's never seen any portrayal of the, on film, of the Holocaust. There's been a number that I've sort of asked her if she was interested in watching. Um, uh, she never has, uh, but anyway, she must have been aware of it. But also, it was in this period of growing awareness, generally, in in, um, in 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 this country, and she was very. She followed a lot of public affairs and everything. She must have that maybe that was part of what was going on with her. But no, she was the same person, only more so. And uh, <laughs> and uh, anybody who knew her, um, she was just sort of almost a stereotypically Russian. I mean, very fiery and tempestuous and dark and light and all that stuff. And so no, she she didn't change. She just found. Uh, that this, that she just found out that for this must have been, you know, consciously or not, she must have been withholding it. You know, again, I think it probably she felt much better telling the story. Uh -huh. um, and then one more question. I didn't. We maybe got here a little late, but how did you two connect for the, the story? Oh, um, I was researching a different book and had read Hiding the Spotlight because I was reading a lot of World War II books, and I couldn't stop thinking about these girls, and so I said, okay, I need to contact Greg, yeah. total stranger. So I can send him an email, and I said, I really think this needs to be a middle school book. And um, for all these obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And then I was asked to speak at the University of Florida, and Greg lives in Florida, so while I was down there, we met, we all had lunch with our husbands and wives, and they invited us back to their apartment to show us the movie and show us a few more artifacts that they had. And it was really funny because we had met at 12, and we were like, oh my gosh, we've been here for like two hours, and we need to get up and go. And we looked at the clock, we'd been there for five hours. So we were just talking, 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 talking. And I think we just kept talking over the spring and just realized that this was probably a good idea. And yeah, we have members of the Remac family here. My best friend growing up, and still, my best friend really is Bruce Remack from school, and members of the Remack family here. And it's interesting that when Bruce and I were growing up together in Bloomington, Indiana, we never had any. We never. We were both basically first. Gen, we were sort of Holocaust survivors. Remacks. Uh, mom and dad came over from Germany earlier in the 30s, right before the worst. They were smart. They got out early. But Bruce and I had no idea who, what our identities were beyond, you know, our, our names. And, and that's kind of interesting that we never, I don't know how long it was before he knew that much about his history. And I was thinking the other day that I still don't know enough about the Remac history. I have to get together with Bruce and find out more. <laughs> but that's, again, why you have to tell these stories. Yes? Um, your mother, you said you remember her as a performer growing up. Mm -hmm. This might be a loaded question, but how was her relationship to music? Because it was kind of a vehicle for her to survive, and it helped save her. And I don't know if that was something she really enjoyed, or if it was something she grew away from getting older as you were a kid. Boy, that's a really good question. It's way above my cycle, <laughs> my pay grade. <laughs> so, no. But I, w I would say that um, you know she became pianist uh, an artist for the right reasons. I mean, she grew up in this musical with her father. He was, uh, always wanted his children to be artists and, and, um, and virtuosos. And so uh, she learned to love music early. And she really, really just loved music. And, and so I think that um, uh, it, it was, in many ways, it was 
the most important part of her life. And she married a musician. My dad was a musician. And matter of fact, she uh, told a story about how she had, when she came to this country, very soon after coming to this country, she was taken to a concert at, um, in Washington um, and heard he was in a string quartet. And uh, she had never met him. But they were taken to a concert. And she was sitting, listening to the concert. And she heard a sound. It was just a magical sound to her. It sounded like horn playing. It turned out it was my dad playing the viola. And so she fell in love with the sound before she fell in love with it. So, so yeah, music meant a lot to her. And uh, um, she was especially proud of her April 1st birthday. Yes, it really is April 1st, because she shares it with her musical hero, Rachmaninoff. So, so yes, um, yeah, that was, uh, um, and so that was at the, at the, center, the center of her life. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's that great, great quote you read last time that one of those playing the Dachau prisoners. Yeah. Oh, talking yeah. About music. Yeah, one amazing thing that happened, I think Susan's going to find a quote here, is that after the war, um, she and her sister were in a displaced persons camp for a long time, nine months or a year, and they bored to death. But anyway, Larry, who, the man who became my uncle, um, my dad's brother, um, he was the head of the camp they were in. And there were many camps like that throughout Germany. And anyway, he is a music lover. Couldn't play, but he loved music. And one thing that, that Larry organized a concert um, shortly before they left for this country in 46 uh, for Frida and uh, Jana to play a concert uh, for, for, the, for survivors of 2,000 survivors of Dachau. Mm. And so they had the experience of playing, you know, getting the stage and playing for the they're, they're all survivors there. And um, you want to read that quote? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is Jana being very poetic herself. Let's see. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Oh there it is. Okay. Um, Susan Wright said and as she, speaking about my mother, as she played, Jana glanced out at the rapt audience and connected to her fellow survivors, quote, I was playing holy tied to the listeners' hearts. I was, I was there with them, alive, with my sister, their ears connected to mine, able to hear the music speak. The horror created by Hitler was defeated. The performance wasn't up to my standard, but it had to be, but it had to be, but, had to, but it had done what we wanted, mm -hmm. to lift humanity to goodness again, to fill the survivors of torture with signs of life, and peace without fear. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, that also goes to your question, I think, a little bit. And, and often, and some of you may have been thinking, watching, listening to Susan and, and me and, and watching the film, how could she play for, for the Nazis, for the Germans? How could she do that? And of course, I asked her that question myself. Um, uh, and of course, they had no choice. But how could she do it, um, knowing that these were the, these were the same people uh, that that murdered the rest of her family? And um, and her, she had a simple answer. She said, "I wasn't playing for the Nazis. I was playing for my mother and my father, mm -hmm. and for and for Bach and Chopin and Beethoven. I was playing for them." So, also goes to your goes to your, to your uh, question. That's right. Yeah. Uh, was this the first time you were writing a novel in verse, or uh, second? Second. Okay. So Lifeboat Twelve is the first one. Um, okay. I, I'm a picture book writer typically, mm -hmm. so Lifeboat Twelve is my very first middle grade story, and then this one's my second one. Okay. So as someone who's interested in potentially writing a novel in verse, what are some what's some advice you would lend towards writing in that medium? Um, I would read, a, there's a lot of books out in verse right now, and so it really helps to read those first. Um, that's what my editor did, he sent me a whole big box of books, um, <laughs> just so I would sort of get in the mode, because I really had to switch from writing picture books. Mm -hmm. And I think I had done ones in poetry, in picture book form, so I sort of had that skill. I sort of knew a little bit about poetry, but I, you know, picture books, it's, learning to stop talking and let the art take over. Mm -hmm. You know, you're supposed to like write 50% of the story, here's the writing, here's the art, it's supposed to go together like this. Whereas a novel, you have to do everything. So I had to learn how to describe absolutely everything. Um, but I, 
I just kind of started fooling around with it. I love wordplay, and I think um, books in verse, you're allowed to play with the lines. You know, if there's a train track that's like this, you can have the line go like that. Um, so just have fun, you know. Like, um, I some of the books in verse tend to be, um, you know, a continuing story. I tend to write a poem about a particular part of the story, so it's a whole poem in and of itself. So those are two choices you make, you know, whether you're going to sort of have a continuing um, narrative or if each poem is going to be something in and of itself. Um, but yeah, I would read a lot. Um, what else? Oh, the best advice I could give you is read your stuff aloud, or <laughs> better yet, have someone else read aloud to you, because then you will often hear things that you will never see on the page. And so my lovely husband is often given the assignment, right here in the red, um, often given the assignment to read aloud to me, and it helps me so much. It's, it's an incredible thing. So I would highly recommend doing that. Yeah? Um, just for Greg, how much of that of uh, your mother's history was on paper before she, I mean, I know she opened up to you, but to get all the information about where she lived and what research? Uh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 was, there was nothing. And um, uh, all of the, um, really everything came from uh, my interviews with her um, and, you know, Long, many, many, many hours of interviews. And then the first thing I did after having the interviews transcribed was I had to, I was so amazed by the story itself that I thought, okay, how accurate is this? And so I went through and I, then I went to the history, the documented history, to find out whether her things like the basic chronology was correct. For example, she said when they, when they left, when they left Ukraine, uh, when the Germans were retreating, when they left Ukraine, and they were put on a train by the Germans and taken to Berlin. And she said, they got there, and she got there, she said, in November, she said, uh, I think it was right around the time the Allies started bombing Berlin. And that was very precise, and I thought, could that be right? And I went, she absolutely nailed it, she was exactly right. Second week, I think, in, in November of 43, the Allies started bombing Berlin. But she were, there are numerous instances like that where I test her memory, and she had it exactly. Now, there were some things she just didn't remember. I may ask her a detail of a certain circumstance, and, but uh, she would remember. But the things, she, the things that she remembered, she was virtually 100% correct. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of that. I mean, the, the, uh, the places they went uh, and everything. So, no, it, and, and one reason for there being no information um, and Susan alluded to it, um, for a lot of complicated, not so complicated reasons. The history of the war in Ukraine is, in terms of the volume of it, is the infinitesimal compared to what happened in Western Europe. A lot of reasons for that. And, and so if you go trying to find um, history and facts about what happened during the war, immediately after, Ukraine is just not that much because, uh, for what I said, a lot of reasons. Basically, it was a, Susan said it was a double cover-up, first by the Nazis mm -hmm. and by Stalin. And then the Iron Curtain came down, and academics and journalists couldn't get into Ukraine to do any of this. And so that's why you, you find very little on the library shelves about the war in Ukraine. So, so almost nothing was there. But, but there were pictures. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. The pictures, the pictures. where did we get those pictures? Um, those came from... Well, when the war, when the Nazis invaded 41, um, they had extended family, as you saw in the film. Most of the members of that extended family chose to flee to the east, to the Urals, to Siberia, away from the invasion, away from the invading Germans, to wait out the war. Um, and they begged my, my mother's family to go with them, specifically their, their father, Dmitri. And they said, you've got to come with us. And he said, no. He said, I don't believe all the stories you're hearing. I know the Germans. I, 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 they occupied my, my town peacefully when I was a young man after World War I. Plus, he revered the German musical culture. 
And so he said, no, I know these, these they're not capable of such things. The piano they learned on he ordered from Germany, a Bechstein piano. So he didn't believe the stories. And so he said, we're not going. And of course, that was a fatal mistake. And um, so anyway, the rest of the family, the extended family, after the war, some came back to Ukraine. Most, uh, uh, many of them went to Israel, and including a couple of surviving cousins of my mother's. And so uh, we found out about their existence, and we went to Israel as part of our research, and we went to them, and they had preserved these pictures that you see in the family. And also, um, but those and also the, the shot you saw my mother in the group of entertainers, she's the only one with her head mm -hmm. turned away, mm -hmm. trying to conceal her identity. Mm -hmm. That we got from a remarkable meeting we had, unexpected, in Haikov when we went to do our research. Uh, the, the, the woman who had taken that picture had read about the fact we were going to be there, and she showed up unexpectedly and presented us with this, this photo. And so. Um, they all came from, most of them came from the family, and a couple of them came from, as I said, from people like that. One. But, um, but, so yeah, everything was had to be found, and, 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 and new research and everything. So I learned, to me, it was, a, it was a learning experience. I didn't know anything really to speak of about the Holocaust before I did all this. So I, I spent more time in the library doing these books than I ever did when I was in school, as Bruce, my good friend, will tell you. <laughs> And, uh, and so I, I was learning all this at the same time. I, that helped me actually write the book, because when you're writing for a, an audience, you have to kind of assume they don't know much of the story. And so it was easy for me to do that, because I had just learned it myself, too. Uh, academics who live with this and do decades of research, they tend to write as if people <coughs> know this stuff already. Mm -hmm. So that's one advantage I have um, uh, in, in, in writing the book. Thank you. Well, interesting. I just, I just have more, more comment than a question. My mom grew up in Germany, and um, I guess my grandfather, fortunately for us, made a different decision, and they were able to leave in 1938, but only like the immediate family, really. And then we had the same experience with my mother. She just wouldn't talk about it. And then my daughter um, is a writer, and she went to grandma and grandma opened up to her so it sounds like a very similar oh, kind interesting. of yeah. um, had she also been extremely reticent about yeah, it yeah she she oh. just wouldn't talk about it i mean we knew we knew where she came from and um you know my grandparents had very strong accents and we knew that they came from germany they would talk about they said called it the other side um but they we knew it was like something you just didn't talk about yeah, it's exactly like yeah, and if there was like a movie yeah. on TV that had anything to do with the war, it's like turn it off before mom sees that kind of thing. So, so this testament is another testament to the power of grandchildren, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Exactly. And the other thing is like, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 please go ahead. Oh no, and the other thing so, in terms of memory, yeah, my mom and my aunt. Uh, from the recollections, we drew a map of the town where they were from. We actually went back there, and it was totally accurate. So uh, you talk about the accuracy something? of memory. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, is your book being used in schools? Like, would it be like a mandatory reading? By any I wish. I, wish. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I, I don't know. I, maybe it is. Um, I know that we've, Candy and I have spoken at many, many schools, mostly middle schools, but not only. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that the book may maybe is used in some of those in some of those classes. I just can't tell you exactly. I know they we do those we do those uh, presentations and then afterwards we would get letters and essays from students who had probably been assigned to assigned to do this. I don't know the extent to which now Susan would yeah, is much Ellie's better. She knows starting to be used that, but, but your books, your other books, you've had extensive use of your books, I know, in schools, right? Yeah. 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 Um, Lifeboat 12 ended up winning a lot of state awards and things, so that means librarians nominate like 10 books, and that means all the libraries have to buy them, and then the kids vote on the books. So that's been really wonderful. Um, but yeah, I've been getting a lot of interest from librarians, um, especially because of what's happening in Ukraine today. So yeah, it's starting to get in there. Um, I think, you know, with all the book banning that's going on these days, some people are like, this is too violent for children, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's, 
perfect for middle school and maybe some fifth graders, but in elementary schools may be thinking it's kind of also, too tough. Let me say, I, if given a choice, I mean, people my age, we grew up, if we read anything in school, it was like the Diary of Anne Frank, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. It's a wonderful book, irreplaceable. But given a choice, uh, middle schools, a class of middle schoolers, between the Diary of Anne Frank and this book, Ailey Santa, absolutely this book. Why? <laughs> not because it has her name on it. Because, because one is that it, it not only is a wonderful story, but there's way more history of, the, of what happened in the Holocaust. One thing I didn't think about until I started writing books about this subject, it went back. There's actually very little in the, and don't anybody take this the wrong way, but very, actually very little in Anne Frank's Dyer and Frank about what happened in the Holocaust. And unfortunately, a lot of people read that think, well, okay, I've done that in my Holocaust reading in school, now I know. But you really don't. It's a wonderful book, should be read. But, but the great thing about this book is that kids will not only be caught up in the, in, in the adventure, the amazing adventure part of the story, but they're going to learn a lot about the Holocaust itself, which is so important. And that's what I think is, is escaped. Of. It's, we didn't get that when I was in school, for sure. And, um, and I think that's one of the great values of this book, is that kids will know so, uh, so, some important stuff about the, about what happened, actually. Yeah, and I've got to say, this trip to Switzerland was so gratifying, because I spoke to 6th, 7th, and 8th graders at an international school, so kids from all over the world. And the teachers at the lunchroom ahead of time warned me, okay, they're, you know, adolescents, it's pre-holidays, they're going to be really uh -huh. rowdy, I'm so sorry, it's not you. And I got there and I started talking about this book. It was like this wow. silent, I could have heard a pin drop. It was like they were completely wrapped in the story. So that was incredibly gratifying. So it's something to do Has your daughter written about the story? Has she written? Oh my God. It, it, did she write about? Yeah, write, she has she? Like more um, sort of fictionalized short mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's been working on some things, but not yeah, nothing like not a comprehensive account mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. But that's good. And, and you. I just wanted to say that speaking about the, the third generation and the granddaughters and that connection, you know, we've talked about that, and you saw a slide of of Amy's letter to her, her grandmother and then this outpouring from, from her grandmother. And Amy's name is up there, Susan and Greg's uh, websites, another room contact are there, but Amy's is not there just because of, of that and getting her grandmother to talk. Turns out that um, our daughter, I guess we raised her with, with some chutzpah <laughs> because when she heard that HarperCollins, who published Ava Santa, was uh, going to put the book on audio, um, Amy, who had never done that before and had only listened to one audio book, <laughs> said, do you think they'd let me do it? And so Susan said, well, you know, they've got a stable of um, professionals, but, you know, send in something. Yeah, I was trying to let her down. Yeah, yeah, I was like, these are professional actresses, yeah. and you yeah. could try, but. but exactly. <laughs> Turns out that they chose Amy to do the audiobook, and she even has she tries to do her grandmother's little bit of uh, an accent, you know, at, at the different Aww. stages of her life. And another, you know, um, poignant note about this is Jana's uh, memories were, as we said, were so clear and pristine, and she now has very advanced dementia, and so she cannot read anymore, but when we've been there and she's listening to this audiobook about her life read by her granddaughter, mm. it is just so moving for, for all of us. So mm. it's um it's been a, a family journey and now part of our family is the, the Hood family and, <laughs> and we just um, are very happy that it's <clears throat> it's out there for many ages. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm the grandmother of a Holocaust survivor. Um, and I've been to the town in Germany that she's from, and I went uh, a few years back with her, and it felt very isolating, felt kind of like scary to be there. It felt like we didn't belong there. Um, and then she actually passed away in 2021, but we went as a family last uh, this past summer, and it really felt like I like belonged there. It felt like a home. It felt like um, a place I feel connected to, and so I was curious, especially having not known 
very much a oyster of your family, or, or especially the Jewish side, I guess. How you felt going, you know, walking the streets that your mom had walked, and uh, like how it, how you feel connected or maybe disconnected to the, the place. Well, I use a hackneyed word, but it was kind of surreal. I mean, yeah. it really was, and it, and it was. I, I reminding myself that, that, that these places I heard about and seen pictures of, and things I keep walking the same, the same, uh, the same, uh, the same ground. Yeah, it was a very surreal. And I, one other thing I did for the other book I did called Judgment Before Nuremberg, is I went back and um, there was a death march from their town to uh, to the uh, killing field that they made amazing to escape, but. Um, I went back and I walked the same route that they did because I mm. uh, she had described it where it was mm. and I had walked I walked the same route on the same day in the same kind of weather that they had. Mm. Oh, they were taken away on December fourteenth or fifteenth in wretched late cold uh, mm. uh, and uh, with hardly any you know just threadbare coats and so on. So I was not working on walking under those circumstances, but I did take the same route and basically the same kind of weather to 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 try to get a better sense of the feel of what it was like on that last journey that they took, um, and, um, and all of it was just very surreal. And then I had the tremendous challenge of trying to put all that on paper. So it was, uh, but going there meant all the same thing, and also walking through the killing field where they were meant to have been interred. And, and, and buried, and really, at one point, you go down into a ravine, it's part of the memorial, memorial you walk up, down in the marine, ravine and then back up, and basically walking at some point, thinking, was walking, uh, really walking across the ground where, where my grandparents, uh, where my grandparents had, had been buried, so yeah, yeah. Um, and how about finding their names? Yes, uh, because uh, that, and you saw in the film, their names were on that, on that memorial. I mean, they were presumed dead because it was thought that nobody had survived that death march, and that's why their names ended up on that, on that memorial. Uh, and um, when we got to Ukraine, I think, Candy, if I'm wrong, didn't we, weren't we the ones to tell them that yes. there were some people they there who didn't heard, know? They had never heard of anyone who survived that march. Yeah. And Yar, Dubitsky Yar and Baba Yar, Yar is for ravine yeah. in Russian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have some relatives who died of Some relatives who were, I'm oh, sorry. My grandmother said that she, I'm not sure she remembers the name, but we had a relative who died in the ravine of Baba Yar. Really? Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, yeah, Baba Yar is the granddaddy of all those killing no people. It's it. like 33,000 mm -hmm. 33, dead at, at um, Babiar and then like 16,000 at, at Drupitskiar, um, and uh, later that year, later that year. Mm. That's one thing your book reminds us about, even with the pain and trauma, there's still some things that are joyful. Well, that's what I love too, that, you know, there was the horrible things happening, but all along the way as they're escaping, people took them in. Mm -hmm. You know, didn't ask them any questions, just pulled them in the door, gave them food, a place to stay. Mm -hmm. So, incre you know, a great peril to their own families. So those kind of kindnesses are so impressive. Mm -hmm. And Greg and I went to Israel to make sure the Bagancha family were noted as the righteous among the nations. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, so, at, and, and at um, Yad Vashem, we walked through the, the room of tragedy, or, or whatever they call it, the children's room where the mm -hmm. candles are lit, mm -hmm. and the names of the children are being said. Jean and Frina's names were still being said. Mm -hmm. So we went there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, one of these cards. Candy has some of these. Thank you, everybody, for great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.